Welcome everyone to Fowler and the Gardens Trust fabulous marathon. <laughs> um, the, as Helen said, this is the third talk in our series and, and this is uh, on, on the landscapes and gardens associated with commercial developments. So we have one business park, one headquarters office building and two factory sites. And so and we're going to start this evening with Stockley Park, the business park. And we're really very fortunate to have Bernard Ede, who was part of the master planning team, to talk us through the vision, the challenges and the execution of this project. And as before, we invite two speakers to offer very different perspectives on each side. And the second speaker is Claire Watson, the lifestyle manager at Stockley Park. And one of her roles is to deal with the interface between the landscape and the people who work in many of the offices there. So when I discovered that Bernard was born in St Austell in Cornwall, it was obvious that earth moving and reclamation was part of his DNA. After an undergraduate degree in geography, he studied landscape architecture at Newcastle under Brian Hackett, worked with Peter Swan on the 50 year development plan for China Clay, and then worked with our previous speaker, Neil Higson at Milton Keynes. Following that, he set up Bernard Ede Associates and the Ede Griffiths Partnership and worked on a series of land restoration, landscape planning and development projects in the UK and in mainland Europe. So Bernard, the floor and the screen is yours. <laughs> uh, thank you, Annabelle, and good evening, everybody. Stockley Park, now. Stockley Park, a major, interdisciplinary project I might emphasize. I was a member from the beginning of a large multidisciplinary team um, which engaged in this massive project which lasted at least nine years in terms of implementation and has carried on incrementally uh, since. Its location is strategic in relation to London and the Green Belt. It's just north of Heathrow, off the spur opposite the Heathrow spur, off, off the M4. It has strategic location with regard to business parks. Business parks were in, in a way invented or thought of first in the United States, where um, the idea of having offices in parkland like landscapes were conducive to the quality of work and the quality of space which was expected. So the business park idea really was imported from America. This is a particularly strategically important site as I mentioned, but historically speaking, north of what was, if the cursor is showing the area of Heathrow, this is historically um, a, a map of the Dawley estate from the 1690s, upon which we've implemented, uh, sorry, superimposed um, the outline of the Starkley Park project. So historically there was a formal house here with formal rides and avenues and informal avenues and other open spaces. So the site was um, subject to extraction of gravel and gravel having been exported into London along the Grand Union Canal came back loaded with domestic refuse which was used to backfill the void created by the gravel excavation. Then it was so-called restored by putting a clay capping over the site and this is the site as it existed when I first visited it in April 1984. Poorly restored, so close to um, London, so close to motorways, so close to um, the green belt, as really to represent a disgrace. The standards of restorations were, were quite appalling. After the so-called restoration, the levels were built up and tipping continued. There, there was an underground fire and the water was polluting the Grand Union Canal. The water derived from leachate, that is rainwater, having 
percolated through the landfill, oozed out in, into the canal. This next slide shows just by comparison, actually it's the first phase of Stockley Park that is phase two in this area, but just for comparison purposes to get some idea of scale in relation to well-known well London parks. In terms of location, in terms of topography and setting, it, it's on the verge, on the, sorry, on the edge of what we call the Them, Thames Valley Corridor, um, intermediate between that, the he, flatland here, Heathrow Airport, and the higher ground to the north, um, the Chilterns and Harrow on, on the hill. So it was, as it were, an, an outlier in topographical terms, or potentially um, from land to the north. The, the, the higher areas are, I think they're 50 meters and higher, um, the dark areas are wooded. So that then um, zooming in, an early drawing I did, which tried to understand the context of the site. That is the spatter of open spaces you seem to get in um, urban areas. Um, the broad north-south corridor of the Cone Valley Park um, the area north of Heathrow and the so-called um, M4 linear park, um, together with the spatter of open spaces. And we wanted to understand the context of the site. This is a Stockley Park site with adjacent open spaces leading into it. Um, and we wanted to understand how that linked um, to uh, adjacent areas, how, how this became an important component of structuring the site. The original ground conditions are summarized here in a diagram, landfill, flooded areas and working gravel pits. Rough grazing area here, which you saw earlier, um, supposedly restored, um, but that's a source of clay. The project emanated really from the fact that this was land in such a state that the local authority who owned it didn't have the resources, either financial or technical, to restore it. So a partnership with a developer, that is with um, Sir Stuart Lipton and Stanup, um, was formulated to have an agreement so that the land was released after restoration for a, a business park. Um, that was about a third of the area. The remainder of the area restored for public use, that is, golf course, district park playing fields, equestrian centre, and um, playing fields, general open space. So the project became a land reclamation project. In fact, a, I would call it a land recycling project in, in another sense. That is, one of the objectives was not to have any net import or export of material, so that everything had to be site one, recycled, reformed, um, without any material coming in. There, there was material brought in later, which I'll describe. So some of our first studies were looking at the possibility of a new landform. Um, the objective was to excavate material from the business park zone and create a new topography. So the business park zone to the south here was to be excavated from the business park and relocated to new topography to form the public and golf course areas to, to the north. On top of that, we looked at a planting structure because planting was to become a major transforming element of, of, of the plan. These diagrams explain a little more with the amenity area, the new topography, the land uses gain and the planting um, structure. But um, the site one clay and the gravel was to be taken to the business park area to form building platforms, um, a road network and uh, the basis for a lake system. And the landfill excavated from that area to be safe for the building zone had to be relocated to the north and form that new topography. And we carried out many um, studies in terms of what the original landform was like and the possibility of different landforms 
to accommodate the various uses. And obviously we had to accommodate the volume of material that was, was to be excavated. It was a very com complex task. From that also, um, we conducted studies, and this is one of the uh, diagrammatic plans really, um, a searching plan to relate the site to its surroundings. No site is an island um, in, in landscape terms. And what's very important, as I mentioned earlier, the, the pedestrian network and, and connections and how they could be fitted into the land, how the public footpaths could then stitch down through the business park and thence to the Grand Union Canal along the southern boundary. It was a requirement of the local authority that the site um, should be accessible to the public, but they are in a way discretionary footpaths um, on, on private land. But corridors of movement and pedestrian movement are very, very significant in the determining the structure of the new site. We work with Arab associates as the master planners, the ar architects and master planners. Um, OVAP and partners were the engineers responsible for the geotechnical and the engineering reclamation, um, together with specialist joint uh, consultants from Holland, who uh, grant me, uh, which I think means land making or land make. <laughs> Um, they were experts in uh, landfill reclamation uh, sites in, in Holland. That expertise was brought, brought into the team. So the essential members of the disciplinary team were architects and urban planners, urban designers, um, engineers, reclamation consultants, uh, landscape architects, uh, golf course consultant Robert Trent Jones from America, a very famous golf architect, and Charles Funke, who um, was the um, planting consultant and responsible for plant procurement. But one of Eric's early ideas was to take the, the idea of, of star ahead, an example here, where there's a circulating path around a series of lakes and is Kevin Lynch, the American um, designer said, it's a rich succession that's now ahead of space and incident ar around a circulating footpath. So conceptually, that was an idea which led to the master plan model, um, which I was, um, put together in embodying all, all of our design work. Um, and that, in regard to the business part, the concept was that there was a central open space system with, with lakes that was part of the drainage system and that buildings should be oriented onto the lake system. So you create value by buildings having a frontage on, onto open space. The first buildings, um, the first three buildings are here. Um, the access of the usually bypass would then lead to a series of views across water to a landmark building here, thence to a landmark group of trees, past the trees, across lakes, a view toward building. So it was a very highly um, constructed co concept rather than, um, if you like, designed by, by accident. It was all quite purposeful. Um, an illustrative plan which really summarizes what's built. It actually shows phase three here, that's not been built and there's some different buildings at phase two. But the, the point is that everything was looked at comprehensively and that landscape, meaning outdoor space, outdoor space, its planning, its design was comprehensively designed and totally integrated with the architectural and um, uh, if you like geotechnical engineering. So these things stitched together, no one component was looked at in isolation. And I think that's a major um, a characteristic of this project and indeed others, but it was necessary here because of the complex technical problems. An initiative plan of, of, of phase two, a very important thing to achieve is a series of illustrative, very clear plans, both for the planners and the public, and, and obviously for our client. 
a client footed all the fees and all the construction costs for the whole project, even for the um, public areas and the golf course, which were subsequently handed back to the local authority. So we had an enlightened client willing to invest, should we say, in open space, landscape and, and amenity. And these are hand in hand with the development of the building. So from those illustrative um, exercises and technical investigations, one of the first things we had to do is derive technical drawings for the new landform. Um, so the business park area here, phase one, and then phase two here, um, th this is a contour plan that was eventually translated into um, technical drawing. This is a comprehensive computer-based drawing where we looked at the geometry of the buildings, the, the car parking uh, and the lake system so that every component was brought together on, on our computer drawings. The um, engineering and architectural drawings were similarly on, on computers, so everything was coordinated in space. And I emphasize again this comprehensive integrated approach where landscape design, landscape architecture is not considered as a, as a shallow veneer and an afterthought. It was an integral part of design right from the start. So this is a new, completely man-made landscape. From such drawings, then obviously one can zoom into um, detailed areas to show the integration of, of um, Foot, footpaths and different elements of the golf course, as well as um, the building and car park layouts. This is the raw material. This is the excavated landfill from, from the site. It's quite quite horrific. Um, don't think that anybody's in there. I haven't seen any yet. But the whole idea was uh, landfill transfer, as it was described. So the landfill was dug into and sorted into young landfill, old landfill, together with some of the um, clay capping, which was originally um, presented. This is beginning to show, showing the sorting of, of the landfill because the whole con construction of layers uh, three meters deep was proposed by the Dutch engineers and this is contrary to conventional practice, whereby a landfill site is, is domed and a clay capping, usually about a metre high, is put over that dome to shed water. Um, the dome prevents penetration of uh, surface water, uh, of rainfall and the gathering of surface water runoff to the edges. If the water did penetrate, it would, it would generate or accelerate the process of uh, methane generation. But at the same time, if you cap a landfill site, you're actually building up methane and you get um, outbreaks of methane and you can come some times get explosions of methane off site. So this is a progress shot up on the landfill on some of the high ground, this sorting process going on. And this is turning over some of the young landfill and bringing over some surplus clay um, subsoil from, from, from the um, site, which was site one. An aerial shot, the, the new landform area being um, proposed, being uh, formed here, the new business park area zone here, zone one, um, phase one, phase two. So you can see clay being excavated for, from this area and brought down into the main part of the site. So the idea was that the business part was founded on gravel and clay, gravel pads and clay buns um, for the roads and clay basins for the lake system. So the material, a big choreographic exercise to pre prepare the ground, the, the ground had to be right from the start um, to reduce pollution, to intercept and cut off um, drainage into the site, which was coming from externally um, to the north of the site. The high part of the site um, in the height of activity, I think this was um, uh, 
early spring stroke or, or summer 1985. The project started on site late 1984 and we got planning permission. This is a stone picking exercise. Once the subsoil was spread, um, stone picking proceeded rather tedious job for the contractor. We felt sorry for the contractor, but they had to work to a very, very high specification. And we had site staff um, together with um, engineers and reclamation consultants watching the contract at all times. We in turn as designers and responsible for the specification were um, our shoulders being looked over by engineers Sir William Halcrow and common resource consultants, landscape consultants to check our work, to check our specifications and to question us regularly about the technical e efficacy of the whole project. This is cultivating that top top layer ready, ready for seeding and planting. Then minor landforms in conjunction with the golf architects, we designed in the route of routing of the golf course, but they then by arm waving on site managed the micro topography around the uh, bunkers and the tees and, and the greens. So it was a series, if you like, of um, s s uh, smaller interventions to get that right shape. So you get the overall shape of the land um, and then the micro topography, the, the incidents within that land formed basically from the beginning. The site was then secured with um, grass seeding and alfalfa and clover. This was to introduce greenery and to stabilize the surface. Um, and to produce nitrogen because alfalfa, clover, what have you, produ produces nitrogen. This was subsequently uh, ploughed in. Into this also um, were introduced 1.6 million earthworms, um, or as the Dutch consultant kept on calling them, the worms. These were also introduced, um, forgot to mention, with dried sewage cake from sewage, um, from the Perry Oak sewage works, which is west of Heathrow, where Terminal 5 is now built. Um, this was the only, together with the worms, this is the only net import material in the soil construction forming uh, process. So there was no topsoil import. Um, we reactivated, if you like, the biological processes. Um, rather than introduce um, virgin topsoil, which would be inappropriate and highly costly. So the planting regime, this is a series of plans and cross sections for how we achieve a woodland planting on that site. It was early on decided to a forest and create and replicate uh, oak, ash, woodland association based um, trees and shrubs woodland on, on the site, 20% of the site area. So we derive with common resource consultants um, a technique whereby the, the plans, uh, the north, um, sorry, on the upper part of, of these diagrams, diagrams, a sequence of diagrams, this is the objective to create um, an, a naturally structured oak ash hornbeam based woodland association that the, this cross section shows what what we would like to achieve in, in the long run. But to achieve that, we derive, derived a planting system whereby a grid system comprised a matrix of nurse species such as alder, uh, ribinia, particularly um, on the drier sites, gray alder and um, Italian alder, plus birch, and they would form a matrix, these, the bigger areas here. Within that matrix, there would be blocks of long-term and medium-term species, such as say field maple, wild cherry, medium-term, long-term oak and ash and hornbeam. Any of those um, trees within that matrix could, could survive. So it's almost a shotgun approach whereby the sequence develops whereby the matrix nurse planting develops, 
some of the long-term species survive within that matrix. It's a sheltering matrix from, from wind. It's also, um, if you like, early presence, the rapid growth of alder, birch and rabinia, giving you that, that early presence. That, that would lead then to a pattern of the younger but longer term species together with the um, subspecies. And eventually we'd end up with what we're after in about year 100, um, the, the objective. So that technique was employed. Uh, bare earth areas were created. These are the plantation areas, the bare earth. We considered that we had to create bare earth so to reduce competition from grasses for um, nutrients and, and water. So these areas were set out um, for, for planting. Some of my crew here, Peter Schmiel just won his gold medal and best garden in Chelsea. So he's um, on, a, on a winner there, he was early days. That's the setting out of the plantations on this matrix system. So dollops of um, peat to um, determine where plants went. And plants were just saplings, um, 300, 450 mil um, height onto the bare earth. Plantations beginning to form up. This is after about a couple of years. The grass, uh, alfalfa, clover were, was plowed in and preparations made for the golf course uh, fairways. Plantation after about three years with birch and alder romping away. About five years with wildflower meadows in the, in the district park and public park. You can see uh, an earnest cyclist belting up the hill there. That's after five to seven years, I think, that shot with some of the edge species would have been um, uh, viburnum and hawthorn and obviously dog rose, but the growth of the um, nurse species, the birch, rabinia and um, alder, which is just spectacular. Usually on landfill sites, our research uh, showed that about 20 to 30% of the plants failed. On this site, it was no more than six and seven percent. Extraordinarily successful. Golf course having been formed in the background with the plantations romping away. Here we have in the foreground um, two of the oaks. They were actually seedlings. They, they were no more than three to four inches high at planting. And then I, th I think we've got an, probably an Italian alder there. So that's the sheltering matrix with the shrub edge planting. Together with forestry planting, um, there were larger trees. So there were 140,000 transplants in the forestry areas. And then um, on the site as a whole, the business park and within parts of the public park, uh, 40,000 um, semi-mature and um, advanced nursery stock trees were planted. And this is part of the so-called lime necklace, an idea that Arab had for binding the public park and the business park together, uh, a necklace of lime trees, which would eventually form a canopy related to footpaths through the park, both the business park and the public park, and that they would be manicured and cut um, to form, as it were, a hedge, hedge in the sky. A shot of the golf course, probably after eight or nine years, plantations, Mass, massing up and giving you that mass space. An aerial shot of the west side of the golf course with all the elements that I've described. Robert Trench Jones, um, iconic, um, very convoluted uh, bunkers here and his dramatic um, uh, teeing areas off, off headlands of water. So all of this was choreographed. Golf course opened by, I think, Nick Faldo. Not that I'm a golfer. Um, as well as golf, obviously, uh, footpath network was totally integrated together with Brideways 
Um, so we have an intrepid runner there. Some of the uh, standard trees developing and plantation masses in wet areas, obviously, um, we, we um, had willows and alders planted and some of the uh, wildflower meadow areas. The lake on the west side, part of the Gulf um, clay uh, structure, but also obviously um, a wildlife and an amenity resource. Cascade down to a, a lower lake. I remember this day very well, very, very hot. This is the first time I saw um, swallows um, skimming over the water and, and, and dragonflies, and I felt the sight had, had come to life. It, it was quite a memorable moment. Um, an, another early um, a progress shot of, of the golf course and the high, high point of the landfill. So this is all of the relocated landfill forming the new topography for the, for the commercial park. Shots taken the week before last, I, I found it quite extraordinary to see it after all this time. Um, I hadn't seen it for 20 years. I, I had a forced um, retirement, as it were. Um, so these are oak, oak trees, um, quite spectacular. The success of this is, I found quite, quite extraordinary. I'm not being magnanimous there. It's the team's effort, the techniques, the processes, the contractor, the client, everybody worked together in this. And this, this is what, um, what was achieved by that team, not by any one individual. Footpath on the western side going up to the high spot. These, these are planted as standard trees. This is the edge of plantation, shrub edge, dog rose, hawthorn, what have you. And obviously um, dog walking, walking. This is a Lime Avenue. Um, this is a shot of the, the earlier shot I showed you of the advanced nursery stock trees along the footway. That's the, those trees. 20, 25 years later, very gratifying. So now to the business part, the business part, the first part of the business part, um, first three buildings, seed buildings as um, our, and Stuart Lipton called them, um, were to be completed in time for an opening by Prince Charles. That was to be, we got the master plan approval in December 84, um, this was to be opened in June 86 from, from scratch. So we have the entrance avenue, plane trees, the so-called lime tree necklace of Caucasian limes, which thread their way through the park, very much related to roads. The, the points I made earlier about upon um, entry, you come into the tight canopy of trees, of plane trees, look across to the central arena site that wasn't designed at that time. With changing views, the, the plane trees at the roundabout, and then the next view across the water to two buildings, and you go around about. So it was all carefully constructed and orchestrated in design terms. Buildings fronting the lakes together with footpaths and car park areas tucked in behind, enveloped with hornbeam hedging up to uh, three to four meters high, and then canopy trees such as uh, Swedish white green, and then signature, signature trees at entrance like wild cherry, for example, willows and wetland trees along the lakeside, park side, if you like, and the higher ground here, um, uh, evergreen, juniper and ground cover with, with birch, these interstitial spaces almost like small garden spaces between building. So that was, if you like, the vision, that's what we were tasked with um, producing. Then Arup produced wonderful models to convey, obviously, the design concept, pavilion type buildings in set into the landscape, fronting on, onto water, as I said. Um, simple, but very meaningful, clear um, concept. A progress shot going back to the reclamation process uh, again, um, with good reason. The landfill coming up to the lawn path of site for the public park, the clay being brought down from the borrow pits um, to the north to form, as I said, buns for the roads and then basins in clay, impermeable material to hold the water 
and for the series of lakes and their circulation and gravel pads for, for the buildings. So there was no landfill within the business park um, requirement of the client, requirement of environmental agencies, requirement of future occupiers. So as work was going on in the landfill area to the north, new topography, um, this is a circle of trees in the first roundabout, London plane trees. This is the lakeside edging, Eki, a Dutch, um, well, sorry, um, e Eastern, um, I can't remember the Latin name, um, used by the Dutch a lot in river and uh, marine engineering, water, very, very hard. Um, that was piling behind um, concrete channels. So as the late water was coming up, the buildings were going ahead and the earthworks were going ahead. A winter shot show that things just did not stop. One, one or two um, romantic opportunities. That's, that's the high spot in the, in the public park in the golf course. This is a headland to, to the northern lake. This was a lake. It's just a shot that I was leaving one day and I couldn't resist taking it. As the water was coming up, the buildings were being completed, all the landscape works, the soft landscape works, as opposed to the hard landscape, the engineering, um, water edge. So, so the engineering and the hard and the soft landscape works involving simple timber um, structures proceeding simultaneously for, for that given deadline. This is another day I'll never forget. Um, I think this is a liquid amber, but this, this, this thrush, I noticed something in a tree. And I think this is the first time I saw nature occupying the site, as it were. I, I wonder what happened to this thrush, but there we go. A moment I'll never forget. Again, another progress shot with retaining wall and a future cascade at the head of one of the lakes. Um, the footpath network being constructed or installed, all the interstitial open space areas together, planting um, London plains here, cracked willows, white willows, and um, uh, other ornamental willows in that space. Couldn't get a closer shot than this without either being arrested or falling into the lake. Um, Prince Charles switching on the cascade. That was June. I think June 6th or June the 9th, 1986. So we started on site. Um, that is, that's a year and a half from scratch. Um, so it was one heck of a time scale. Central area, um, a, a later shot, probably three to four years on um, in the wind. Um, dramatic opportunities for, for, for photographs. A winter shot, um, headland, with, with um, timber clad piling and, uh, and stones, mellow colors, very, very simple um, repertoire of landscape elements. Obviously the in light, um, enlivening effect of mass planting of, of daffodils in the summer, grass in the spring, grass areas and um, waterside um, plant development. Simple structures, use of timber again, replicating the use of timber in the um, lakeside edging. Um, Lacrida, uh, sorry, <laughs> Lucadamba trees and, and grasses and um, Pakisandra terminalis ground color, very, very simple formula. Again, um, robust details, timber decking, timber steps with gravel, use of ground cover here, I think Irish ivy a rampant ground cover, which gives quick cover um, and willow. Of course, the park is not park. Park is for people. Um, so pe wildlife coming in, Canadese, which were uh, a bit of a problem. And uh, this is one of the footpaths within the um, business park open space and one of the lakes, so-called teardrop lakes, part of this, another set of lakes which threaded their way through the building areas and we created tension between the weirs the timber weirs and the footpath levels so that you're slightly set down um, below that um, water level creating a, a tension which is still there today this is the arena building a, a super building the central facilities building with restaurants and uh, um, 
uh, gym and uh, conference rooms um, designed by Richard Frewer, a good friend of Arab Associates, very sort of Scandinavian in a way, um, bringing the earthwork right up to the building, a terrace or platform here, and then stepped um, slopes here again in timber. But in the foreground, um, very um, robust use of the same uh, designed material that Arabs, I can't remember the name, proprietary name of their stone, but they designed this particular aggregate um, block, which is used in the arena, the central building, the arena, a central circular structure. Again, the simple timber, bulk timber devices with the water and the colour in the winter with, with our dogwood. And the same material used, the head, head of the lakes, the um, first roundabout, the plane trees. The um, bridge, the um, asymmetric bridge, which again paid for by our, our clients, Stuart Lipton and, and Stand Up Securities Limited. Um, the local authority engineers jumped at the chance um, to design that bridge. Um, they were paid fees and uh, our client paid for that bridge across the Usley bypass to, to be applauded, to put it mildly. Again, um, very simple, robust, chunky, should we say, details with, with brick paving. A similar shot, detail uh, decking and lakeside. Then phase two, um, to illustrate the intimate relationship between building, we worked very closely with Eric Parry um, with this, whose building phase two concept was a, a cracked building with water seemingly emanating from between the buildings, an upper lake with water, waterfall, a pool, a cascade, and then a lake. Cross section, sectional, ele sectional elevations, that was the upper pool, the cascade here, lower lake, Eric Parry's building in the background to sh show the essential levels, the importance of topography levels, understanding buildings, public circulation and planting. The, we produced dozens of, of these to convey what our design could be, the Grand Union Canal at the southern end of the site. Decking, that's looking Eric Parry's building, so-called so cracked egg building, the cascade here, the lake, the decking, the um, country park to the north, the upper pool to um, that lake, simple robust concrete, aggregate concrete finish. That's the cascade with, with steps, the, the country park in, in the background here, this is the entrance avenue to phase two steps and cascade. Some visitors, I don't know, somebody said these were nicked from Buckingham Palace, but I don't know. But um, black swans, where did they come from? Ducks colonizing, enlivening the place. Um, decking again with what we call the mount steps up with a, a sense, a false sense of perspective with tapering steps. And that's the final product after about three years with um, swamp cypresses. Detail decking, decking for use, individual trees against buildings. I think that was um, I think that was a white willow, um, swamp cypress against building lakes in the background. Low tech landscape meets high tech architecture. This is an overspill area, um, wetland species, shrub, shrub willows, and, and what have you. Another similar shot with timber decking, and the detail of, of um, the water. A lot of this was emergent planting. This is the lime avenue, the lime necklace, well, well developed, that unifying feature that the buildings were locked, locked in, into in the terms of their frontage. The walk to work, that was a very dramatic walk to work just before um, a thunderstorm. Iris is coming in um, after our bulb planting and, and willows. A rather serene space now, this was um, a week or so ago, these little pocket spaces, which are absolutely intriguing. The exemplary um, maintained landscape of the uh, management suite where, where Claire works. 
And then a final shot in my presentation. Um, I wish you had digital cameras when I when I was um, taking all these photographs. This this was 2013. Um, I, I find that an extraordinary shot. So when we think of that rubbish right at the beginning, um, and then we see this, um, it's truly uh, tr transformational. And to, to everybody's credit, I think that is the end of my presentation. Bernard, thank you so much for that. That was just stunning. But we will um, come back to you in a minute or two. Um, I'd like to pass on to Claire now. So Claire's had 15 years experience providing enlivenment programs um, and she's the lifestyle manager for Stockley Park, heavily involved with the relationship between landscape and occupiers, working with the team to evolve outdoor spaces to allow occupiers and visitors to enjoy the benefits of being outside. So Claire, the floor now is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Annabelle. And um, thank you, Bernard, as well. Uh, thank you, everybody. And um, good evening for letting me uh, speak this evening. Um, so yes, as Annabelle said, I am the Claire, well, I am Claire Watson, the lifestyle manager of Stockley Park. And that involves building the community of Stockley Park business estate and building the relationships with the local community around us. The business estate is made up of 23 buildings, all under their own ownership. The external common areas are managed by Stockley Park Estates Company Limited, of which I am a member of, and we manage the 88 acres of the business estate. Until May 2020, there were three extra buildings to the west of the estate, uh, phase three, which Bernard mentioned. However, these were sold by GlaxoSmithKline to ProLogis, who, also, who are having to demolish the buildings to build new warehouses. Stockley Park was originally developed to include the arena, the golf club, the business estate, and the country park. These are now separate entities, and although we are extremely fortunate to have the outdoor space of the country park close to us, the business estate still offers a wealth of outdoor facilities which our, our occupiers are encouraged to enjoy. We have working partnerships with the golf club and the arena to ensure their facilities are open and relevant to our occupiers. The partnership works, so the three entities look and feel similar with open boundaries. This does mean though that occupiers contact us for issues which are outside of our remit, but we are able to put them in touch with the correct individuals. Companies we have on site now are large multinationals including Marks & Spencer, Suntory Beverage and Food, known for their products LucasAid and Ribena, IMG Studios, Canon, Toshiba, Hasbro, Apple, and MSC Cruises, amongst others. Pre-COVID, the number of occupiers on site during the week would be six to 7,000 per day. Our close proximity to London Heathrow, the M4, the M25, and the centre of London means that Stockley Park is a prime location for large, large corporates. Quite a few of the buildings have gone through major refurbishments over recent years, as the original buildings needed modernizing to fit with what, what is required for organizations now. For instance, companies are being a lot more environmentally aware, so buildings are being amended to have drying rooms, showers, cycle storage room facilities and electric car charging points. Buildings are now being upgraded to BRIAM rated and some are FitWell certified. We are aware that there is a new trend for previous office buildings to be converted into residential homes. This will not happen at Stockley Park as the estate sits within a designated green belt and the London Borough of Hillingdon will not allow for accommodation on our site. During 2020, the majority of our occupiers worked from home as the park understandably became a ghost town. As a management team, we allowed for essential services only. This included our security teams and the upkeep of the landscape. Many signs were erected around the park to remind occupiers and community members to socially distance from one another. Bridges were to only have one person on at any one time. Facilities were closed 
and only one person was allowed to sit on an outdoor bench at any one time. With the Country Park and the Grand Union Canal being so close, we find a lot of the community like to make the park part of their daily walk, especially during lockdown. Unfortunately, this also brings challenges as there are quite a few activities we do not welcome on site. Activities we do not allow include drinking alcohol in the public areas, barbecues, swimming in the lakes, filming without prior permission, and no flying of drones as we are within the no drone zone of Heathrow. From September 2021, we have started to see occupiers returning to the offices with many organizations now offering a hybrid of home and office working. Although one would expect the buildings to be emptier with this new way of working, in actual fact, companies are finding they're having to offer more personal space per individual. One of the buildings which was being refurbished during the start of the pandemic was originally planned to be space for a head office. However, plans quickly changed during the start of the pandemic as the developers recognized such vast amount of space might not be required by one company as the world was getting used to working from home. Plans were quickly changed to allow the, the building to become a multi-let building if required. The impact of COVID on Stockley Park has been twofold. As well as noticing the number of occupiers spreading their working week between home and the office, we have also been informed by letting agents that companies are wishing to move out of the city and into a space which works in partnership with the landscape. Stockley Park has the benefit of this as we are located in an area unusual to London. We are within the M25, easily accessible by road and train, but set within a beautiful country setting. When the park was originally built, there was a main emphasis on providing manicured lawns, but it has evolved specifically over the last five years to an area of interest for wildlife and many forms of nature. In 2016, we examined the wildlife on the park to determine where would be best suited to provide natural habitats, habitats for them, along with the planting to best suit them. From there, we have been able to provide areas which occupiers are able to enjoy, whether to, re um, whether to relax during lunch, to walk, or at one of our many events. Species on site are all tracked through internal and external partners. Twice a month, specific routes are taken to track the status of the wildlife. No works can take place around areas of specific natural interest without first an impact assessment having taken place. We are very proud to have on site parakeets, a heron, hedgehogs, stag beetles, newts and geese. The 10 lakes on site are a nursery to carp, with Boyer Leisure maintaining the stock levels since 1986. We are asked a lot by members of the public whether they can fish from our lakes, but they are quickly disappointed when they learn that this is not an approved activity. Our constant tracking and surveys of the areas have allowed us to ensure that we can provide the correct habitats for the wildlife. Currently on site, we have 10 bat boxes, home to four types of bat, including the common pipistrelle and soprano pipistrelle. There are now 13 bird boxes with around 23 breeding bird species on site. Of note, the reed, bed, reed beds on site attract migratory species such as the reed warbler. Hedgehog houses, insect hotels, wildflower meadows and stag beetle loggeries have also been provided for the small mammals and reptiles amphibians we have here at Stockley Park. Many of the areas of natural interest have signposts educating occupiers and visitors of interesting facts about the habitat. Through our landscaping company, we employ the services of Dr. Glyn Percival of Reading University. It is through Dr. Glyn and his studies that we are aware of the number of trees, the types of trees, and the health of each one. So that is 270 trees in total, which cover 8,462 square meters. The three most common species of tree on site 
are the common lime, European hornbeam, and sweet gum. Trees in Stockley Park are estimated to store 71.6 metric tons of carbon with associated value of 18.1 thousand pounds. Oxygen production is one of the most commonly cited benefits of urban trees and trees in Stockley Park are estimated to produce 9.319 metric tons of oxygen per year. The photo shown here was taken last week showing the progress of the current lopping programme our landscaping team are undertaking. Stockley Park's attention to wildlife and our natural surroundings has led for the park to achieve notable awards, including the Green Flag Award, London in Bloom, RHS Britain in Bloom, Green Apple Award, and more recently, the Wildlife Trust Biodiversity Benchmark Award. The landscaping team is tendered and contracted by the management agent. On-site team consists of 15 members and the arbicultural specialists, watercourse specialists and biodiversity specialists are subcontracted. The contract is one of the biggest landscape contracts in, in the country. As well as the homes for the wildlife, the surveys of five years ago allow Stockley Park Estates Company Limited to understand where we could amend the landscape to allow for more event space for our occupiers. The original design of Stockley Park landscape was made when office workers attended site at 9 a.m. and left at 5 p.m. The corporate world has changed with an expectation now for business estates to offer activities away from the desk, either during lunchtime or after work in the evening. The original design of the park did not provide event hubs, which are now very much needed for working life. Speckle has found an amended pockets of land to allow for our enlivenment program. The main square was originally covered in shrubs. So these have been cleared. A cafe made from recycled cargo container was added in 2018 and a lawn to host large events and summer furniture for dry days. Space for outdoor exercise equipment was made along the avenue, a long tree-lined pathway alongside some beautiful lakes. Occupiers and members of the boot camp can regularly be seen using the equipment, which is open for all. More recently, we have cleared an area by a large lake to offer an area of relaxation and mindful wellness. This is now called the retreat. And as well as being a space for occupiers to chill and relax by the waterside, it is also where we host nature talks and live music events. Events enjoyed by our, our occupiers include summer fairs, winter festival, walking club, running club, boot camp, pumpkin carving, and film festivals. These all stopped in March 2020 and the events turned to virtual platforms. As restrictions are easing and occupiers are returning to the park, we are taking a soft approach in our investment in restarting our event program. Events now are very much relaxed with social distancing encouraged, also with an emphasis on mindfulness and well-being. We're extremely fortunate that our landscape offers all occupiers the opportunity to escape from their desks to take a much needed breather. We learned a lot from our occupiers as to what they would like to see and experience at the park. This information is generated via annual surveys to all occupiers, regular forums with occupier facility managers and landlords, as well as one-to-one -one meetings. We have been successful in reducing the amount of traffic on the park, as previously occupiers finding it difficult to leave the park onto the A408 just during rush hour. Speckle operates annual traffic reports and has been able to add traffic calming solutions in terms of speed bumps and lowering the speed limit to 20 miles per hour. This has reduced, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, this has reduced the number of traffic jams. We've in, um, introduced a green traffic network to encourage occupiers to use public transport, as well as providing discounts for bicycles and accessories and walking, cycling buddies and car share. A shuttle service has been put on for peak hour traffic between our local train station, Hayes Harlington, 
and Stockley Park. This is a free service from all members of the network, which was stopped during COVID, but we're excited to say we'll be up and running, running again from next week. So please do, um, to learn more about Stockley Park, please do follow us on social media. It was a pleasure present, presenting you to, the, um, to you, all, you, all of you this evening, and thank you so much for listening. Claire, thank you so much for that extremely um, comprehensive review of, of how the park functions now. And, and I have to say, you managed to answer all my questions, so I think you can uh, have a, <clears throat> a well-earned break. <laughs> I can relax. Thank you, Helen. But thank you so much for that. Um, Bernard, are you there? Can you come back and join us, please, and uh, unmute and uh, switch on your camera? And uh, we will... I'm um, here, but it says unable to start video. Um, don't worry, Bernard. Your, your ears and voice are most important. If you can get <laughs> visual you. contact, that's fine, but don't, don't worry about it. Bernard, can I start with you with a question of my own, if I may? Um, um, you mentioned right at the beginning the importance of the landscape as added value. Ah, there he is. There he is. Um, the importance of the landscape in providing added value to the client. That's obviously something which always concerns landscape architects, how we evaluate and how we value landscape. And I was also interested that um, obviously that value is even uh, is increased now with the COVID pandemic creating a, a greater respect for the outside environment. But I wondered if you could remember what percentage of the overall budget was actually spent on that landscape, obviously of high quality, but it would be very interesting to know if you could recall. I can't recall off hand, but if you give me a minute. <laughs> Sorry, Bernard, to make you jump up and down. No, 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 um, not at all. I mean, so often these budgets are, you know, you're lucky if you get 1% of the value of the full development or the cost of the full development. It is written down somewhere, but I can't recall. I just looked at Anthos. It's about open space components, but not costs. Um, don't, don't worry. I, I can't recall offhand. Um, the, it is documented. It is a considerable. The, the the volume the, the the value you mean of of the works capital value yes capital that work. would be that would be brilliant. Oh, gosh, I know it's considerable um I think the works for the um country part were in excess of four million mm -hmm. um and I can't remember for for the um business part but it was in the millions I think the whole project is probably 300 million, the whole project. Yeah, yeah. But um, it'd be a lot higher, the investment in the um, business park. But mm. no, I can't answer that directly, but it well, was considerable. Thank you, thank you. And it was recognised, sorry to interject, but it was recognised by um, Sir Stuart Lipton and Vincent Wang, the team of, of, of stand up fr from the beginning. And it was also, as it were, prescribed by the local authority in the planning conditions that there the was to be, if you like, equal weight given to external open space. So it was recognised right from the beginning. And of course, technically, it, it was necessary in any way. It yes. wasn't as if it were, were a byproduct. It was planned in right from the beginning. Mm, thank you. That's a very encouraging response. Um, message from Hal Mogridge just says thank you for a brilliant presentation of a splendid scheme and I think we would all echo that. Um, you, Paul. Annabelle I know would like to ask you what was one of the most difficult things about this project that you had to deal with? Technically or design-wise? Um, um, An Annabelle. Annabelle do you want to unmute and answer that? <laughs> Uh, well, either or both. Preferably. 
I don't know if I found anything particularly difficult. I, what I found so encouraging was we were in a multidisciplinary team. We were equal members of that team. And I felt we were with brilliant people, that there the was interplay um, between the disciplines. And it was a very open system together with the client and together with the construction managers, Shell of America. Um, I, I don't feel in my bones that there was anything in particular, I have to say. Mm. It was a very gratifying experience. We, we, to a certain extent, learned things because it was innovative. The, the, the whole technique um, of landfill uh, restoration on this site was unique. One of my, call it disappointments in inverted commas, is it probably hasn't been proclaimed enough and I'm not sure that the techniques which were evolved here particularly using Grant May as consultants on the um, topsoil construction methodology as opposed to the impermeable clay capping um, I don't know if it's been applied elsewhere I, I would hope that it was I have to say I haven't tracked it but in a, a Annabelle I haven't really answer anything specific. No, 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 you have. You I, have. I haven't, I didn't come away from the project <laughs> thinking that was problematic. Yeah. I, we, we got through it all and I think the programme achievements and then the physical achievement on, on the ground, as it were, spoke for itself. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was painful in one way because of the time pressures. Um, maybe that was the most pain, painful thing. But we felt we weren't alone, if, if mm -hmm. you know what I mean. We, we had site staff, we had staff down, down in our office in Warminster and um, regularly going out to site. Um, I suppose that distance may be one thing, but nothing more, I feel. Do you want to ask your follow-up, Annabelle? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I gave a whole lot of questions, but yeah. just in case nobody else had any questions, so do um, <laughs> please be encouraged somebody else to ask something. Oh, look, one new one's come up. Coming in, let's just see. Um, question here from the Gardens Trust. How is the site monitored for gases, etc., from the remains of the landfill? I'm not familiar with that now. It was nearly... 19, 20 years since um, I had to um, forcefully retire. Um, Claire, I don't know if you know, I know there is still monitoring going on with regards to- That is correct, uh, yes. Yeah, there's still monitoring for methane. Um, I can't answer how, um, but yes, as said, we certainly have specialists who come in and, and do that for us. I May think I? Sorry. Well, I was only going to ask a rider very quickly of Claire, are there any other issues that um, the restoration has caused or is it withstanding the test of time? That you're aware it certainly of? is. Um, a lot of people are amazed when they walk around or um, Stockley Park and then learn that it's the oldest business park in the UK. Um, you know, it's, it was built in the mid 80s um, and we've got such a wealth of history on, the, on this estate. Um, I think with that, though, it's it shows with the landscape how mature the landscape has become now, uh, hopefully shown in my in my photos in my presentation, that Bernard's original view is coming to fruition and uh, and has te and has tested the um, you know, time. Sorry, Bernard, I interrupted you, but thank you, Claire. Anything you want to add to I, that, Bernard? I, I, I just back on the methane. Um, mm. the, 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 well, the concept was that the methane from the um, landfill would emanate through the, the, the permeable surfaces created by this three meter deep structured topsoil zone. In parallel with that, there were methane vents installed. And I think they were, as it were, a precautionary measure. So I think the methane testing is, is going on from what Claire said in relation to those um, additional methane venting, which were probably, as it were, an insurance policy. As I said earlier, the problem with landfill sciences is the methane uh, migrates 
laterally um, into areas immediately abutting the site and, and also methane can build up under a clay cap, but that, that problem um, didn't exist here because of this innovative uh, technique of topsoil construction. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we will wind up definitely at quarter past, but I think, um, Annabelle, I'll allow you one more question <coughs> if you'd like. And if anybody else has one, um, pop it in the chat quickly. Um, and then we'll we'll wrap up if we may. But um, Annabelle, do you want to ask another question? I know you had some thoughts. Good, yes. Bernard, did you have any other jobs running in your practice the same time as Stockley Park? <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Um, yes, we, 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 we did. We had um, business parks in, in the West Country, um, commercial developments, uh, super, supermarkets, um, a new um, college graduate college at Durham University. Um, when, when Roger Griffiths and I formed a partnership, um, it became Ede Griffiths Partnership. Um, at that time, Magna Park, a big distribution park from, from uh, converting an airfield in, in the Midlands at Lutterworth. There the were other smaller projects, no, no gardens at that scale. It's mostly, mostly commercial developments, mm. um, Bristol, Temple Meads um, development, Waterside started, um, but that's now been rebuilt. So um, there were other projects, but this this was the the big one. This was um, nine years for the first stage to, to, to opening finally, and um, the, the sorry achieving phases one two, hmm. and and then it tail, tailed off um, because phase three was looked at but but not pursued in the original. Mm -hmm. state but um you know, so it, how many sorry to interrupt how many of your office then were involved with it at one time we had in rugby and warmest so we had 22 staff um of which i've probably probably we had a about half of them have been chartered landscape architects mm -hmm. and i think four about a fifth were um computer technicians mm -hmm. and, and then assistants so it, it 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 migrated a bit. We have people coming and going, but that core, yes. the core, I'd say the core team, my, myself, David Coons, Peter Ruler, there were six really in a core team, vir mm -hmm. virtually full time on it. Mm -hmm. um, so okay. it was a big commitment, but it was a big, big project and mm -hmm. it warranted a lot of concentration, which we mm -hmm. gave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank Annabelle, you. can I pass back to you now in your role of chair rather than as questioner? Yes, except I'm going to ask Claire a very quick question. <laughs> you can't control the chair, can you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can anybody come and visit Stockley Park? I'm sure having watched or heard all the, the talk that, you know, there's going to be like a whole lot of people banging on the door saying, well, when can we come and see it? <laughs> Yeah, everyone's welcome to come and visit Stockley Park. The doors are always open. As we say, we, um, we have made the boundaries uh, open still, as Bernard um, asked, and, and, and in, um, designed the park, so the, the country park, and um, we have the facilities of the arena close by, so we do have lots of members of the public coming. Um, during lockdown, the first lockdown, we had quite a few regular uh, locals come and use it as their daily exercise and they actually became quite pally with the landscapers on site mm -hmm. see from a distant this mm -hmm. would ask questions to see what the landscapers were, were doing on that day and um, and they've continued to to return to the site on a regular basis which is lovely but yes the park is open and we do invite people to come and, and mm -hmm. visit and, and enjoy mm. fantastic well I'm thrilled to bits I think you've, um, <laughs> I think the pair of you who just sort of presented such a fantastic uh, history and, and coverage of, of how the site was transformed from uh, those, some of those shocking early photos, Bernard, I mean, really shocking to, to uh, just a wonderful workplace.
I think. So thank you so much for all your time and thought and effort, both of you that went into this. Uh, um, I think we're really grateful and I'm so pleased actually that we've got it recorded as well so other people can can listen and follow the story and understand it. Thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, can I express my, my thanks as well because it's it's been an interesting process and it's been somewhat emotional and a, a lot of pressure but to bring what was a lot of disparate information in terms of hundreds and thousands of slides, it seems, mm -hmm. uh, together. And, and I try to make it as, as terse and comprehensive as possible, but it, mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. been um, a worthwhile experience. And I would like to thank everybody that helped, helped me put it together, particularly Susan. And um, I've met a lovely bunch of, of people during this process. Thank you yes. so much. Can I ask um, our audience to unmute? And, oh, uh, no, hang on. Sorry, oh. just before you do, oh, sorry. there is one last question. <laughs> Bernard, your archive. I've got to ask this because half of this blooming series is about archives. <laughs> so tell me, what, where, where are the drawings and what's going to happen to them? Well, a lot of drawings have gone, I'm afraid. Yep. Um, I've got a lot of slides. I've got all the drawings that I've shown here. I've got large one very large comprehensive drawing that that I did um I, I will make them av available to to the archive um I'm ch chasing up um one of our computer operatives to see if he kept discs of, of the drawings um because I I, I um, retired in um what was it 2003 so um a lot of it has gone, has disappeared, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, and I didn't think ahead with regard to archiving, but I do have considerable number of slides and I've got drawings which I will, will certainly make available to the archive, if not, you know, Fantastic. donate. <laughs> Fantastic. But um, a, lot of, a lot of the drawings would, would be technical drawings any, anyway, construct construction drawings yeah, yeah. Um, I've got most of the design the original design drawings and sketches and right. reports immunity air reports and um, and and other documentation brilliant it will brilliant. be available 